Okay, um, so there's a um, moderately reasonable attempt on the, the, the full name. So this is around 800 current era. And he wrote one book in about 1825 on the calculation with Hindu numerals. That was a book on arithmetic using Hindu Arabic numerals. And then a few years later, he wrote this book. And in the title of that book, you'll see that phrase algebra. And that's where we get the word algebra from, because this was the world's first recognizable algebra book. And that was the focus of the book. <coughs> and that phrase in there, at the end of it, really means restoration and confrontation. Those terms that we saw a moment ago in connection with Diophantus. The way of solving an equation, move things from one side to the other, and remove equal terms from both sides. Um, if you want to translate the whole thing, and again, I've got this translation from one of the leading scholars of the period, uh, the abridged book on calculation by restoration and confrontation would be uh, a, a modern scholarly translation. Uh, it's usually, however, known among scholars as just the abridged book on algebra. Uh, because nowadays, we would just refer to restoration and confrontation as just as the key method for solving equations. So it's algebra. And uh, the question that people like me get asked when we teach uh, students that are not necessarily uh, enamored by mathematics is, uh, not at Stanford, but if you go out elsewhere, then they'll say, you know, what's, what's this useful for? You know, is this really any use? Well, let's go back to the source. Um, al Khwarizmi's book is essentially a modern algebra book. You know, the, the language has changed and we've got better examples and these days, we have full-color illustrations and all that kind of thing. But if you go back there, uh, you've really got the beginnings of the modern algebra book. And, and al Khwarizmi answers the question. Here's what he says. What is easiest and most useful in arithmetic? This is what the book is about. Such as men constantly require in cases of inheritance, legacies, partitions, lawsuits, and trade, and in all their dealings with one another, or where the measuring of lands, the digging of canals, geometric computations, and other objects of various sorts and kinds are concerned. It doesn't get more fundamental than that. This is, this is basic commerce. This is how people trade and live and, and, and enter legal dealings and deal with their finances. So algebra was introduced for very, very practical reasons. Um, you know, one thing that's characteristic of almost all the writings of what's known as Arabic mathematics, meaning the writings that were preserved in the Arabic writing, um, and you know, all sorts of people were involved. Uh, there were Persians, there were people whose natural language was Arabic, uh, there were Jews, there were, you know, there were Christians floating around, there were people floating around in the Middle East, all over the place, and in Spain, doing work. And, uh, but it was the, the language in which, just as we talk about Greek mathematics, much of which was done by Egyptians, but, it was the, but Greek was the language it was recorded in, there's this phrase, Arabic mathematics, which really means it was recorded and stored in the Arabic language. Um, okay, but it's, it, it gets extremely useful. It was very practical. And certainly the interest, although the Greeks' interest was very much one of a sort of a leisurely pursuit, an intellectual pursuit. The Greeks, as famously known, thought of mathematics, particularly geometry, as a, as an, as a, as a, as a pursuit of the mind, something for the leisured classes to do, something to think about to, to, to improve your mind. Um, Go to the Muslim world in the 8th and 9th century. It was driven primarily for very practical reasons. They were engineers, they were traders. And so <coughs> this was designed to, be an in, to improve the way of doing business. Um, there's a, an image from a... I, I forget the date on that one, um, but it's an image I managed to get all over the, the date from one, a version of that book. But if you look at the contents of the, of the book... And this is not meant to be a translation from there. This is just a summary of the contents of the book. This is it. it basically, in that book, he takes linear and quadratic equations. And uh, actually, at the end of last week, we had a, I had a discussion with a couple of people as to why there was this huge focus on quadratics. And you know, the answer is, if you're a practical person, you can do an awful lot in the world with linear equations. Sometimes things change at different rates, and linear doesn't work. The next best thing is quadratic, and within, within a certain range of tolerance, that's as far as you need to go. 
you know, even an exponential curve looks quadratic over a small interval. So it's just a reasonably good approximation. You know, look through physics books. <coughs> physics books, classical physics books, are full of linear and quadratic equations. Well, it's just because that was already difficult enough and good enough for doing an awful lot of things. You know, and as, as physics developed, people realized there were, or, there were higher order terms that you needed to take into account, but over reasonable areas of, of, of accuracy, that will do. Same with computer graphics, right? You, you, can, you can draw almost anything with a computer graphics package that will draw straight lines and quadratics. You just put them together in a suitable way. So these, you, can, you can do piecewise linear and piecewise quadratic curves and get all kinds of nice shapes. <laughs> okay, and um, so this was really developing machinery that was extremely u useful. Uh, you might ask yourself, why regard these as different? Because we don't today, we just talk about quadratics. We say ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. And that's a quadratic. Well, the reason was they didn't have negative numbers in their calculations. So they had to take account of whether the a's and the b's, these were all positive. So you had to put them on different sides in the first place. In fact, their conception of negative numbers was really unusual. Um, the confrontation, those words restoration and confrontation, confrontation is sort of easy. You've just got equal things on both sides. They confront each other. Well, if they confront each other, you can, you can remove them. Restoration means you restore the value. Instead of dealing with a negative term, so they, they wouldn't have something like 10 minus x. What they would say is you've got a 10 and it's, it loses weight. It goes on a diet and it loses x pounds. So you've got a slimmed down 10, but it's still positive. You know, you've, got to, you've taken something from it. Then you work with it and you, get an, you, you do something. And at the end, you restore its value, which we would say is adding x back to both sides. But that's not how they thought about it. They, 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 they didn't have subtraction and they didn't have negatives. So they just thought of diminished quantities that were still a 10 minus x was still a 10. It was a 10 that had lost weight. You reason with that, then you restore it at the end. Uh, it's hard to get into that mindset now because we know there's other ways of thinking about it, but that was, that was how you, if you want to understand their writings, you have to understand that they didn't have subtraction. You couldn't subtract from both sides. You could diminish something. And that was where the word restoration came from. You restore the value of the thing. Stanford University.